Hello and welcome back to the Hypothesis Podcast. We are here on our second season or episode 15. So hello, I'm Liam. Uh, Patrick's here. Hi everyone. We are back after a short, well, maybe a little long hiatus, around almost a month and a little bit. And as you have heard, we have something new. And this time in this season, we have a new tune to begin our podcast. Nevertheless, today is going to be a little, hopefully different, because as you know, Actually, at the time of recording, the Queen of England has passed away. So it has been a big change in a lot of people's life. And actually, Liam, our Liam is in the UK. So he will talk a little bit about that. And us being back, it feels great. The, at least the break for me has been feeling very refreshed and rejuvenated. So now um, we are back onto the standard workload where we have to go do a teaching assistant and whatnot. So with that, let's start with what's new. Anyone have anything new today? Anyway, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the UK right now. I'm uh, visiting Cambridge University um, for work. I'm, I'm attending this weird conference program thing about... Well, it's not even a physics conference. It's a kind of mathematical asymptotics conference. Um, one guy that I'm publishing with and working with is helping run it, and he invited me down. And you know, I figured I'm uh, I can live in England for a month and not have to pay for it. Hell yeah! Well, I heard that you met Michael Berry, your deity, today. Oh yeah. So Michael Berry. Um, Famous physicists, not not like Einstein or Stephen Hawking level famous, but you know, in the physics community, most people know who he is, um, primarily because he discovered this thing called the geometric phase or the Berry phase, as it's called sometimes now. But yeah, he was my supervisor's supervisor, so he's like my my grandfather supervisor, I guess, um, and he's kind of a big deal. He's been knighted. He's Sir Michael Berry. Um, he's won, oh, I forget what it's called, but there's this kind of, he hasn't won a Nobel Prize, but there's this version of the Nobel Prize. It's kind of like the meme Nobel Prize. Um, what's it called? Uh, I believe it's called the Ig Nobel Prize. Okay. Anyway, he, he won that with somebody for levitating a frog in a super magnet or something. Um, but yeah, so he's done a, he's a machine of a physicist. He's, he's, he's published like 500, 600 papers in his lifetime. It's, it's insane. But yeah, so I got to meet him today and talk to him with my supervisor and hear a talk from him. So it was all really cool. Yeah. I think, uh, I guess the Nobel prize from the, the name Nobel, but, uh, yeah, the word noble, the opposite of that is ignoble. <laughs> That's why they call it ignoble prize. Yeah. I guess it's Nobel or Nobel, but. I feel like I always pronounce it wrong anyway. Uh, just in terms of updates of what we were up to over the break, I was in also a different country doing some field work in Costa Rica. So I was looking at collecting sensor data for temperature, uh, soil moisture, where we're able to measure the amount of water in soil, which is important, especially for measuring droughts and extended rain periods. So I was there for two weeks conducting some different in sensor installations and repairs and climbing 100 foot high towers just uh, to extract some data about the wind and the environment of uh, different tropical dry forests in Costa Rica. Well, you climbed some 100 foot towers? Yeah. So we have these very narrow towers, which are just a triangle of steel going up. And at the top of them, we have different wind sensors and carbon flux sensors that measure the amount of carbon dioxide. There are also some methane sensors. Usually they're solar powered, but yeah, they're typically around 30 to 40 meters high. 
when it was in reserve, they taught us that when we jump from the tower, as a part of our training, they said the optimal fear uh, height is actually 100 feet. So I think 33, 34 meters. So that's when you realize it's not uh, too short that that you know you will be fine, but it's not too tall that you will die anyways. So it's the optimal point where yeah, when you go down, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> I know you guys have heard of that. I feel like you'd die anyway. That that's pretty high, but yeah, maybe I guess not all the time if you're lucky. I I remember reading somewhere that. I think in the LD50, so the level where 50% of the population would die, humans in terms of falling, I think it's 40 feet. So if you were to fall from 40 feet, you have a 50-50 chance. So I imagine that's a bit less, but still survivable from 100 feet. Yeah, I think that I got it wrong. It's not, I, yeah, it's not 30 meters, it's 30 or 40 feet, like, yeah, 10 meters or so, because that's why I jumped off. Well, it doesn't feel like 30 meters. 30, 30 meters is, like, really high. <laughs> yeah, I was, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I don't know, man, 30 meters is pretty high. Like, you might survive, but you'd have to hit some trees in a funny way, I guess. I can attest that it is pretty high. And even with a canopy that's about 10 meters above the the ground, it still feels high. But I was strapped in there, lots of safety equipment. We we don't take risks and no free climbing at all. So they got like a uh, scientist to do it. I'm I'm surprised they didn't get any technician or engineer to just do those, you know, change the sensors and stuff instead. So, so that's something uh, about field work is it's good to get the scientists down there and also it's expensive. So you want to use as much time as you can and use I guess, the least paid people that you can. So in this case, the flights were paid for and the accommodations were paid for, but we weren't actually paid to do it. Whereas the technicians can be, I've heard of $500, $600 an hour to have technicians doing the same thing that we're doing for free. So it's a cost-effective thing and you also want to give the students, aka me and some other students who were there, the experience of how the sensors work, where they are, and how the data is collected from them. Yeah, grad students are very cheap compared to like an actual technician or engineer. <laughs> so I can see that. Um, so that's interesting. However, this is the first episode of our new season. So do we have any kind of announcements or things we're going to do differently this season? I don't think there's that much we want to do differently, but maybe there is. I know something we're interested in doing this season is having more guests on. So last season we had one guest who was an excellent astronomer studying her master's in astronomy at Queen's University. You should go ahead and listen to that episode. However, we would like to have more guests on. We have people who have contacted us about being guests, but we're interested in really whatever topic that you might study in the sciences, since this is a science podcast. So if you have a topic that you're really passionate about and you're studying, whether you're a, a still a student or a professor, a professional researcher in some aspect or another, if you have a topic you'd like to talk about, please feel free to reach out to us. And we would love to try and get as many people as we can on the show as guests. Yeah, one thing I I'm trying to do differently this season is to basically not be too technical. That's one of the feedback I got a lot where it's like, well, it's interesting. And then we start spouting physics stuff where, well, so it's for us, it sounds normal. But I think to the majority of people, they were like, well, what are these things? You know, but I feel like there's some scientific integrity we need to keep to make sure everything is accurate. But we will also try to be more in, in, inclusive. Yeah, when, when we went into this, we, we never really had a set level of kind of, um, I don't want to say skill, but but knowledge that you need it to understand. We kind of just went in and said, we'll talk about it however we feel like. And I think we always try and aim and keep it simple, but sometimes we get into like the more hardcore science of the situation and it, it's a good thing. I'm I'm not going to stop doing that, but maybe maybe I need to spend more time on the Maybe we should spend more time on the kind of the basics of it before we talk about anything more complicated. Yeah, uh, I think it's always 
good to look things up, especially if you don't understand them. So if you happen to hear something that you don't really understand or don't know about, really, look, there's plenty of material that you can look it up, even just searching the term into Google and diving down that rabbit hole. But if you want some of the information that we're going off of, because sometimes we reference documents or different articles, papers, books that we use to gain this knowledge in the first place, you can send us an email as well and we'll try and get back to you with references. And again, this is uh, a science podcast, so it's always good to ask questions. So if you, the listener, has questions, then I'm, I'm sure all three of us are more than happy to try our best to answer them. Yeah, a lot of the stuff is like publicly like so there's there's some things we talk about which are very research focused or they're from like a publication in a certain journal. And that's that's definitely a lot harder to kind of find if you don't know where to look and you don't have the kind of access to it through some university. So those are I cannot. Yeah, that's definitely a harder thing to reach. And asking us about that might be a good idea. But a good chunk, well, at least me, a good chunk of the stuff I talk about is publicly available. And just like half of the information I get from Wiki even, which maybe isn't a good source to do it from. But like, for example, I'm going to be telling a story later this episode. And I got all of that information from Wikipedia. Because it, it, it's in the Wikipedia, right? So you can, you can double check these things. Um, but yes, I agree, Patrick. All right. I think... We can we move on a little bit, but before that, um, Feely, Feel, what were you up to during the during our little break? You said you were you were refreshed and rejuvenated, but what would you get up to? That's literally what I was gonna say. <laughs> oh, okay. That's that's literally. Um, so I didn't get to go to Costa Rica. I did not get to go to England. I didn't get to go anywhere outside of Canada. So I'm just hanging. So yeah, I get to go to the East Coast in Nova Scotia in Canada to just relax because I'm writing a paper right now that I'm trying to publish and it's a little difficult when you stay in the same place and you know, 9 to 5 in the same office. It's not very fun. So I figure I'll go see some friends, you know, sit down, go stay at my friend's place and work it out. And it turned out pretty well. I just got my mental re reset, you know, to go back to the North to the Christstone now, just <laughs> back into the Queen's campus and working. So as it's been great. Nevertheless, so this main topic today is about fire. <laughs> the reason I chose this because I was listening to music. It's called Fire. And this past week, as I mentioned before, the Queen Elizabeth II passed away. And that's a big change. And fire historically has been represented change all these times. So if you think of the ancient Greek fire, basically a symbol of change, um, Heraclitus, one of the early philosophers, I think like 600 BCE, and he even described the world as the everlasting fire. Because back in the days, you, you heard of the elements, earth, water, air, fire. So people think of, well, what does what the world's made of? You know, there are elements that the world's everything, all the material in the world is made of. But Heraclitus doesn't like that because he uh, noticed that the only constants that is, you know, uh, this constant in the world and is the change itself because all things are incon inconstant and changeable. One thing transformed to another, you know, as a cycle in the material. But the only thing that doesn't change or <laughs> is inconstant is the process of change itself. And what is changing all the time? Fire. If you look at fire, fire changed all the time. So he used that as um, like um, to refer to change or the world itself. Like the world is ever living fire. So fire was basically have been thought as change for the longest time. Or other things, you know, a lot of uh, early philosophers have these metaphors using fire. If you think of Plato or uh, working on Socrates stuff, 
In the allegory of the cave, the fire is used as the light source to make the shadows that we see. So in particular, those fire represents the doctrine that, that teaches, um, that is taught to the people at the time or at certain place that you know, provide knowledge structure to, to, uh, to mankind. And when you talk about knowledge, the topic of fire also comes up. If you remember the Greek mythology, when man or human um, become basically intellect. So it's come from the, the deity Prometheus that seizes the fire from the gods that give to mankind. So fire also signify knowledge. So you might have heard of the term divine spark. If you think of spark, what is spark? Spark is basically literally like a, an ability to create fire. So fire has been think historically as, you know, change has human knowledge as something that, that create basically all the knowledge of mankind is fire. But since you are pretty much a science podcast, we're going to talk more about how it's related to science because fire, as scientists know it, have a very di different descriptions to what I have just said. So maybe leaning into what Patrick has been doing, I was want to talk a bit about fire and life. Because fire in, in the forest, fires are actually crucial in maintaining healthy forests. I think in the popular belief in the modern world that all oh, forest fires are bad, that's not historically has been thought of. If you look at the the native indigenous population, you know, there are controlled burns to keep regulate fires or regulate um, the health of the, the forest. And if you look, actually, you can Google the fire map, the forest fire map of the world because they can use satellite or remote sensing to see where it's fire. In any big forest, there are fire, small fires everywhere. And if you think about fire, it actually burns down, create those coal, create, you know, charcoal, create carbonized material in in the forest yeah it's interesting i guess the power of fire because we always say that fire cleanses and in this case it kind of does but also resets things so this is something i worked on uh while working with the government partially is actually mapping fires uh as you mentioned using remote sensing techniques so every year we produce a giant fire map showing which areas have burned, how, how large those areas are, what was involved with the burn, those types of things. So as someone who's currently living in Alberta, forest fires are a major aspect of life here, especially in the summer. Right now in Edmonton, at least this past weekend, it was smoky from forest fires in BC and Alberta, where it, it, it looks, it's a smog. It's, it's smoke that's producing a haze over the city where you can barely see for a couple kilometers, keeping in mind that it's very flat here. But fires are also very interesting to see in forests because they have a lot of different causes. So anything from a lightning strike to a very hot exhaust on some sort of all-terrain vehicle. Anything can spark a fire depending on the dryness of the conditions. And the thing is, is as we're seeing the earth warm up, we're seeing more drier conditions, so more fires. However, because we're trying to actively fight fires, uh, so we have whole sections of government in Canada dedicated to fighting fires, we're also creating better opportunities for fires to happen. Yeah, I remember watching some news sometimes back home, there was this forest fire and they traced back the origin I know how to do it. It sounds like magic to me. But they trace out origin to some tourist cigarette. Just they just, you know, I just snap out cigarettes on on the ground and it, you know, over time I think somehow it sparked and became a big forest fire. So I think there was a movement, I think decades ago, that tried to ban or like put out awareness on don't create sparks in forests. Yeah, it's funny how that happens, how one tiny little spark or cigarette can cause so much devastation. And one other thing I find really interesting about fire is, like, it's, again, we've had an episode where we talked about water and stuff. Like, it's, fire is super common. It's 
you have a campfire, you have a fire and a barbecue, you have a match or a lighter, you know, forest fires, a whole bunch of things. It was like back in the cave person days, if you created fire, you were a god kind of thing. Um, it, 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 but it's also one of those topics, and as a physicist, I, I look at things and I say, ooh, I wonder what causes that. But for some reason, my entire life, I've never really wondered about fire until you brought it up. I don't know why I didn't. I think I just accepted fire was a thing, but like, I have no idea really what even causes it. I, I, I know it must be some kind of, I mean, it's some kind of reaction that emits light on the visible spectrum because we can see it. But other than that, I have no idea kind of thing, like at least on a fundamental level. Yeah, it's interesting to think about fire fundamentally because it does impact all of us and it's impacted the history of humans. It, it said that fire is what allowed us to grow and progress and evolve as a human species because we could cook food and make it safer to consume raw foods. But I, yeah, looking at the basis of what fire is, I, I think we should just explore that. Yeah, that's why I think the next part before we get the next, the next part is going to be more on the physics of fire. So now I think while we're on the topic of life and fire, I mean, um, I remember learning biology back in the early days. <laughs> I was like really young that there was a postulate on, on how life was created in the first place, like the first ever life life form on earth and it was postulated that there was this a lot of lightning that happened over the ocean and that create a potential difference that somehow maybe a little bit ionized or create a potential difference in the sea water that allow these organic material to form or like those organic material to buy together and sounds like sorcery again but we don't really know what happened at the early stage of life. I, maybe we now have better idea, but I'm not sure. I, but I feel like lightning and and, and those kind of high voltage, it's kind of almost required. If you see those sci-fi, you know, Frankenstein, they already, always have like this big battery where you had hooked to the corpses. Yeah, just a side note with that. There was an experiment that someone did where they essentially just took a whole bunch of amino acids, put them in a sterilized, air quotes, container, and then were able to produce living organism. Turns out that the, it wasn't properly sterilized, but uh, they were essentially trying to replicate the conditions of how life started. But going back to fire and lightning specifically, I think it's important to specify that lightning is not fire so they, they're similar in terms of their composition and but they are two very different things just i i know a lot of people say oh lightning is a type of fire but just to specify that it's not yeah i will mention later but <laughs> the lightning actually create i think true plasma but fire some flames most flames you see are not plasmas but I think I'm going to comment on what Liam said before that, you know, we have seen fire all our life, but maybe like I was, I liked studying about fire, learning about fire. But what I find a little different is that, you know, there's like a channel in North America, maybe in Europe too, that in the Western world dedicated to fireplace. To me, that's ridiculous. I was like, why do we turn on TV to watch fireplace 24 seven? But Fire is mesmerizing, you know. If you have a campfire or have a bonfire, you can just look at it, you know. Like people, what do people do at bonfire? They look at the fire. Marshmallows. <laughs> because it's this um, mesmerizing effect. Maybe it's historical. Maybe there's something that instinctual that draws us to the fire. If you think of insects, they fly into the fire and die. <laughs> and that's not very fit in terms of evolution, right? fitness. <laughs> That's not very good for the species. They just run and die into the fire. But there is something, isn't it? Yeah, it's really incredible the type of patterns that appear in fire, fire. And we can attribute that to turbulence, which 
we we may have to spend an entire episode talking about turbulence and flow and fluids and all that stuff. Although we do have our resident fluid turbulence black hole expert here, uh, we we may have to oh, dedicate an entire episode just to turbulence because it is. I I believe several very famous physicists have said that turbulence is the hardest problem in physics. So it's cool, but it's complicated. Yeah, turbulence is a rough one because because the Navier Navier Stokes equations. But and an, anyway, we can. That's another thing. But yeah, that's why you see those little. That's why the fire kind of curls and spins, and you see smoke spinning and the, the turbulence. Turbulence causes spinning. But so so back to the problem at hand. W- what the heck is fire? Please inform me. So. Yeah, I think in physics we think of state of matter as as solid, liquid, and gas, and we think of fire. Fire doesn't really fit, doesn't it? Like, oh, is is it a solid? It doesn't feel like a solid. Is it a liquid? And uh, probably not. This is gas. Well, it kind of looks kind of like gas, but it doesn't feel like it's gas. So people would come up with this new state of matter called plasma. And plasma is basically charged ions that are free to move around. So it kind of makes some sense if it's hot enough, so it have enough energy in the atom. You know, the electrons that are circulating the atom will have enough energy to escape it and become free. So when it's all most of it are free, then it is called a plasma. However, the the actual flames are not plasma because it has to be very hot for for it to have enough, enough ions to be plasma, because actually there has a criteria, which I think we all have heard about the by length, and we will talk a little bit about that later. Liam should know more, because I'm going to mention the keyword that he will oh, be God. excited about. So the standard flame that we see, we just do like the candle wax, um, wax candle, or like a lighter, or uh, you know, from burning wood, the actual glowing part is actually the glowing of the products of combustion. So as we know as soot, you know, when, you, when we create flame, you get these soot. So it's the soot that is burning or combusting and actually is the black body radiation of those soot that create the flames that we see. I will mention that depending on the type of material, if it does burn hot enough, you actually get a gradient where there's plasma present. Uh, So that tends to be bluer. So not necessarily for all candles, but for some types of lighters or other gas torches, you can actually see like this blue close to the source of the flame. And then as it moves out, it gets whiter and then that yellow, nice fire color. So you can actually have a mixture of this very hot soot and also a plasma in the flame. It just depends on, again, how hot the source is. Yeah, and Liam will know more about the black body radiation stuff. So black body radiation basically just means like anything that have temperature would emit some kind of electromagnetic wave or as we know, it's light. So if it's hot enough, it emits different wavelengths. For example, wax candle has a burn temperature at maximum of 1500 Celsius. And that's, that sounds like a lot, right? But it's very low for plasma. So not as many ions would come out. Uh, and humans, we are smart. We come up with some mixtures of acetylene, which can burn up to 3,100 Celsius. And that's enough energy to create a lot of ions. And, but th- this is the thing, like, well, how do you classify plasma? Like, what, how can you say that this is plasma and this is not? Right? How much... How many ions have to be free to have to be plasma? So the criteria of plasma boils down to the what we call Debye length. Debye is a physicist, and he came up when with a way to represent the basically when it transition between be um, particle be behaving as individual particle and as a collective plasma. Because plasma behavior is slightly different. It has this electromagnetic shielding, <laughs> sorry, electrostatic shielding, which is um, 
kind of hard to explain, isn't it? <laughs> it's basically an equilibrium between electric potential and thermal energy. And this kind of quantified the plasma, but it's, it's also like an um, interpretation of what that thing does. So plasma physics is its own big field where people try to understand it, which I am is not my forte. <laughs> so I think I'm going to ask Liam then. So Liam, in terms of plasma and black body radiation, are they related or are they just completely different field? I feel like, you know, is they're both kind of stat statistical mechanic that used to describe these, but are they really related? Oh, I'm going to start off by saying I know almost nothing about plasma. Um, <laughs> I even thinking about plasma, as you say, all the electrons kind of get enough energy that they're free from their, their nuclei. That reminds me of, that reminds me of um, metals because metals have free electrons that go around or even, even the Northern light, well, Northern lights might be different. The Northern lights is your exciting electrons and then the electrons drop energy levels and then shoot out photons. So that's probably different. Maybe it's not, I don't know, but yeah, I don't know too much about plasma. Um, Black body radiation is basically, yeah, it's the property of some object. Objects emit radiation to go into thermal equilibrium. So when you turn your stove, like stove top on, if it gets really hot, it'll start glowing red. Now there's, there's, it's not a light, it, it's, well, it is a light source. It's a black body radiation source, but it's not like a light bulb or anything, right? What ends up happening is that it's so hot that in order to be to go into thermal equilibrium with its environment, it'll emit out radiation, black body radiation. And if something's a very good at emitting radiation, it's also very good at absorbing radiation. As for a fire, I, I mean, I don't really know like how that comes into play there. I mean, yeah, it makes sense that it does, but so, you're, so how'd it work again? How does this, how is a fire a black body? Well, the suit lit up. All right, and it emits light because it's got hot enough and it creates black body radiation off the suit. The suit? And those suit, yeah, those, the flame you see are combusting suit. Oh, oh, like soot. Right, right, right. Yeah, S O O T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I can see that bleeding of black bodies that it's gotten so hot that in order to, it's much hotter than its environment, so it emits out thermal radiation. Like every, everything does, right? Like humans. Humans. If you look at them with an infrared camera, they emit out infrared radiation. Humans are glowing, which is very, it's very thankful we only see in the visible spectrum. Because if we saw in the infrared spectrum, you'd never be able to sleep at night because you'd be glowing. Um, yeah, so as for a fire, that that's exactly why you see a fire, blue fires hotter than red fires. Because like, the more blue black body radiation is, the more higher energy it is. Yeah, I think when it combusts too, right? The, the suit basically almost became like I would I don't want to say gas, but it just basically that's why the, that's why fire are bigger than look at the match. The head of the match is tiny, but the flame compared to the head of the match is relatively big, right? Because I think the the suit that's how I pronounce it, the suit that that comes out maybe maybe just spread out. I I, I think it might be important to just talk about combustion itself yeah. which is a, a, a chemical process so there are a lot of different ways in which combustion can occur and it's classified as a chemical reaction so for example with if you're burning a piece of wood so let's say you're watching the fireplace channel because we have that and you're wondering okay what's happening where we have this burning the, this bright flames and then it burns down to these smoldering coals and you'll notice that the bright flames are a lot more yellow to even white compared to the red smoldering coals you can have white hot coals but generally it's red coals uh lighter flame and that's because the flame itself is hotter the coals are a bit cooler now with the combustion of a piece of wood for example the first thing that happens is all the vol volatiles are combusted off. So if you think about a piece of wood, it has a lot of 
long, complex carbon chains on it. And a lot of those carbon chains usually have hydrogen. And so with combustion, the two products, if you have complete combustion, is carbon dioxide and water. So you have some sort of carbon burning, the introduction of oxygen to produce uh, water, which is uh, a product of oxygen and hydrogen bonding, and then CO2 or carbon dioxide, which is carbon and oxygen binding. So you get these two different products with complete combustion. You get a whole mess of unwanted products with incomplete combustion. But during the combustion of a log, the first thing that happens is a lot of those very simple carbon chains and a lot of a lot of the end hydrogen is just burned off. And that's what we see as the very bright flames. Then as those long, complex carbon molecules remain, we then see the smoldering coals, which are bright but don't produce this flame because they aren't producing as much soot that can light on fire. So if you think about it, you need some sort of part particulate to be produced from the smoke. And so these violent hydrogen reactions are not completely combusting. Whereas for this, these coals that you're producing, you're getting a lot cleaner of a reaction. It may not still be full combustion. You're probably producing carbon monoxide and a couple other gases in there, but you have less particulates and more complete combustion of these long carbon chains. So I think what I, I think what I decided after hearing that is that, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the color of a fire is it's from partially from black body radiation, but it base it has a lot to do with what you put in the chemical that you're combusting. So that you can get those little I don't know if you've seen these before, but they're little. When I was a kid, you, you little packets of chemicals and you toss them in a fire, and they would make the fire blue and green a little bit sometimes. I don't think those packets were dramatically changing the temperature of the fire, but they were probably changing the chemical compounds that were being combusted. And then those kind of things breaking apart would emit different colored light. Exactly. Another excellent example is fireworks. We get different colors of fireworks because we use different elements to glow. So when they're hot, they may, or when they're releasing energy, they might only have a specific range in which they emit wavelengths at. One thing that definitely is black body radiation is after your, if you have a campfire in your backyard and it dies down and hours later you come out and the kind of smoldering pieces of wood are still glowing red, that's black body radiation, 100%. Or maybe, now I'm doubting myself, but I'm, I'm 99% sure that is. Another interesting thing, I'm assuming this is fire but when when meteors enter the earth's atmosphere they burn up and depending on what they're made out of you can actually tell you can tell roughly what they're made out of based on the color of the tail behind them so i'm just, i'm just, so they enter the atmosphere the friction sets them well, maybe not on fire but it burns off the edges of them until they wither up is that fire or is that i i, I don't know would the burning of pure elements emit certain uh, spectra, spectra, right? Because if you think of a uh, uh, like first year chemistry lab, you know, I think it might be burning copper, and then that is a certain, uh, co a certain color that comes to it. That's how astronomers figure out what's in the stars because stars are basically burning, and it emits different spectra. I think we all have done some kind of interferometry or spectral labs right and those are from the emission of light by burning and the question of fire that you have on meteor that i think is a little complicated it depends on how do we how do we define fire is it just a phenomenon that we see you have to observe as fire at all you know at these flames or can fire be just a condition that just like oh it's combustion there's combustion and there are you know, this glowing uh, material, is that enough to be called fire? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of different ways in which we can define fire, combustion being one. But even then, combustion doesn't necessarily need to be hot, per se. So, for example, 
uh, a couple processes in the body go, undergo the same chemical reactions as combustion that are still exothermic instead of endothermic. I will also add it's another complication is not only elements release specific wavelengths, but molecules as well, both in the visible and infrared, because you get the bonds between the molecules if they wiggle in certain ways or, or rotate or move in certain ways, then those will produce specific wavelengths depending on the bond. So that is another complication in determining composition based on seeing something burning. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because like, you know, the if the sun is a big ball of fire, it it's clearly much different than the fire in my backyard in my little campfire. Um, so like, yeah, what I feel like there must be different definitions. It's like how you can have different kinds of ice, although that might be the topic for another episode, maybe. Yeah, if you look at the, the you know the plasma globe that you play with, you know inside they're probably really hard, right? Those plasma looks. Nice, but they're not exactly fire. Or it, I don't know what it's called in English. You know, those cold flame you play as like as a stick at the festival. It's like kind of little fireworks that's sparkling. Uh, yeah, that's those are they're not hot. Like a sparkler or whatever. What's it called? The ones you wave around and they leave like an after image in your eyes. Yeah, yeah, those ones are not hot either, right? I mean. If you think of about fire, <laughs> you shouldn't do that close to your hand. But apparently, it's not that hot. But we still consider them sparks. And there are people who perform by like you know swinging fire around, and those are fascinating. But they're probably very hot. But how do we classify fire then? I think one thing to clarify is that the sparks that come off of sparklers. They're not really hot, but like the base where they're coming from, I think is is hot. I've definitely burned myself on those, and I burned myself as well on those a couple times as a kid. But going back to the topic of what is fire, I I think if we look at the basic components of fire, and this is something taught in at least we learned in grade school, was you have a triangle for fire. You have your heat on one side, your fuel and then your oxygen. So if you remove one of those things, you no longer have a fire. So going off of that, if we know that we need a fuel, oxygen, and heat already, so it needs to stay hot, then it seems like anything that combusts can, could be considered an actual fire, and anything else that doesn't undergo either complete or incomplete combustion is not technically fire, even if it looks like fire. That's just me throwing out a possible... I guess, defining characteristic of fire. And I'm sure there are many different ways in which people classify fire, but that may be getting into the minutia of what is actually going on at whether a, a, a molecular level or on larger scales. One thing that fascinated me is, was that, you know, there are a lot of theories that we have known for many, many years, right? You know, but fire, the black body radiation is relatively new theory. You know, it, it's probably past 100 or so years, right? If you think of astronomy and stuff, it's been around for thousands of years. People have been looking at stars, but if you, that, you know, what black body radiation, radiation covers is also the stars. You know, fire is such a um, uh, overarching area. That's actually what I really like about statistical mechanics. Right? Is is I like I, I always say it's not a requirement of nature. But it's a preferred configuration of nature. It's like you don't have to create fire. You don't have to. You know, the particles don't have to behave that way. But but if you do it that way, something nice happens. And I think a lot of these statistical physics comes into that. Black body radiation, I think you can probably derive it some from quantum mechanics. Um, <clears throat> but so so can StatMech. <laughs> so I think in terms of fire, it's such a fascinating topic. We might have to revisit it when when we pop when we know more about it or maybe some new research on fire. But I don't think that, that many people really researching flames or fire itself. I've seen a few publications pop up every now and then on fire but they're they're very like specific 
instances. They're not like a campfire in your backyard. They're like specific types of blow torches or phenomenon in like very hot or cold fires or something like that. Well, I think that's an excellent place to end our conversation on fire because again this is a science podcast we don't always have many all the answers and that's the thing about science is we're always trying to search for the answers so again if you would like to talk about fire have questions about fire you can contribute to the conversation you can send us an email you can make suggestions for future topics but we always encourage you to go and do some research yourself and maybe you'll figure out a a full definition for fire and if you want to reach us the best place to reach us is a couple different methods the first one is our email so it's at it's hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com you can send us an email with comments questions queries concerns uh, or, or really just anything. And especially if you are a researcher or some sort of scientist in a field, please reach out to us and we would love to have you on the podcast. Another way you can reach us is we are at The Hyperthesis on Instagram. So we'll post updates about when we'll be posting episodes. We have fun little memes and other pictures. Uh, the f- last picture that we posted is a picture of the three of us from a, a few years ago. So go ahead and check that out and give us a follow. You can also find us on really any podcasting service that you may use. We're on Apple Podcast, Amazon Podcast, Google Podcast. We're based on Anchor FM and we can be found at anchor.fm slash hyperthesis. And really, we're found wherever you get your podcasts. So feel free to leave a review if possible. We love getting feedback for a podcast and we are always looking to improve so whether you're using apple podcast or google or what have you leave a review let us know how we're doing and give us a listen share us with your friends family and even people you don't know now to wrap up the episode we have a lovely story from liam who will be talking about uh someone who's I think influenced all of us in some way or another. And Liam is very fortunate to, I guess, make a pilgrimage to this person's long time home. So take us away, Liam. Yes. So I have a, a story of a uh, certain Stephen William Hawking. You may or may not have heard of him. Um, probably you have. And weirdly enough, Relate, his research related to black body radiation, so that's kind of connecting to this. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the UK right now in England, and I'm visiting Cambridge University. Um, and this was actually where Stephen Hawking was a professor at, a professor at. So Stephen William Hawking, uh, born in 1942 and unfortunately died in 2018, was an English theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and a writer. Um, among other things. He was also quite the comedian. Um, So in the physics community, he became famous for something that I actually, my research is very much based around, um, was that the prediction that black holes aren't actually as black as we think they are. We originally thought black holes can only absorb um, and they would never, ever vanish. They were these kind of eternal things that existed in the universe. That was according to the theory of general relativity. Um, But Hawking actually predicted that they can evaporate eventually. Um, They can emit thermal radiation as if they were a black body with some temperature. Just like our little glowing embers in the fire. Um, And in the modern world, and also among physicists, he became um, famous as kind of the paralyzed physicist. So he had um, ALS, a motor function disease, that left him very much paralyzed. So he had to talk through kind of a, an older text-to-speech program. So if I, I won't try and replicate it, but you've definitely, if you hear this certain text-to-voice um, to kind of speech thing, 
his specific one, you're like, oh, that's Stephen Hawking. Cause he, he kind of, he trade, well, not that he trademarked it, but it became his voice. I don't know about you, but whenever I hear it, I immediately think Stephen Hawking. Um, and he also had to, he couldn't walk or move. So he had to travel around in a little motorized chair that he can, that he was able to steer. So he, he's made all kinds of appearances. He's appeared in T he, he's like Einstein. Actually, he's one of the few celebrity physicists that's, um, existed in, in the world. He's appeared in TVs and video games and movies. He actually has his own movie about him, um, called the theory of everything. It was a, I don't remember all the details, but I remember liking the movie when I saw it, when it came out. So what is his story? So Hawking, he was born in Oxford into a family of physicians. Um, and he had two younger sisters and a younger brother. And during his younger years, so like, I don't know, elementary school, that kind of um, elementary school, middle school, he wasn't that successful academically. But he he did show promise. He was kind of one of those didn't do too well in class kids, but was weirdly smart whenever he put his mind to something. Um, one of his mathematic teachers actually inspired him um, to pursue science because they actually, him and the teacher, uh, built a working computer together out of scrap parts and circuit boards from scratch. So that's pretty impressive. His father didn't want him to pursue science. Well, not in the way he wanted to. He wanted him to study medicine um, at a post-secondary school so that he could have a good job and make money. He didn't think that studying physics and chemistry would be a good thing to do. He didn't think there was any jobs in that field. Um, however, Hawking pursued that route anyway. And he began, he, he began his undergraduate degree at the University of Oxford in 1959 at the age of 17. So during the first 18 or so months of his program, he was actually quite bored and lonely. Um, he, he claimed that he found the, the academic work way too easy, um, which, fair enough, he was a pretty smart fellow. Um, but during his second year, he actually, second and third year of his undergrad, he, he changed. He decided, um, quoting one of his physics tutors, he decided to make an effort to become one of the boys. Um, so he 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 kind of developed into a popular student amongst his classmates. He, he joined clubs. He became interested in classical music and science fiction. And he was known to be quite funny. He was a bit of a comedian, as I said. So he he took like a he he really kind of got into the swing of his undergraduate degree in studying physics and chemistry um one problem however is that he had very bad study habits and you, you hear this a lot from very very intelligent people like kind of you know the genius level people um are that i mean i don't know if he was an actual genius but he's very smart is that they're not great at studying they kind of do things their way and they don't like to do it other people's way so during his undergraduate program, um, he he was completing it, and he he planned to attend Cambridge um, for his graduate studies. Um, but his condition of acceptance to Cambridge was that he had to get graduate his undergraduate program with first class honors, and he actually didn't end up getting it. He got like somewhere in between second and first class, so he had to take an oral exam with his um, committee in order to convince them to push him up to first class so that he'd be able to attend. And he, he was able to do so. He was a pretty witty and sociable fellow. So he, he got accepted into Cambridge for graduate studies, where he was focusing on astronomy and cosmology. During the first year as a PhD student, um, he, he actually found it difficult. So I, I don't know how... It, for, for us, we kind of found our supervisors, but there's some before we showed up. Um, but some universities, and especially back in the day, you'd kind of show up and then they'd sort out who you were working for. So he wanted to work for kind of the, I don't want to say famous, but a very well-respected and noted astronomer named Fred Hoyle. Um, but he actually ended up having, um, his supervisor that was assigned to him was Dennis William, um, Shiyama. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. He was actually... Now they thought of one of the fathers of modern uh, cosmology. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
he was he was upset about this because he thought that the mathematics of general relativity and cosmology would be far too difficult and beyond kind of his undergraduate training, which is it's a fair assumption. Cosmology, Einstein summation notation, that stuff's very confusing if you're not used to it. Um but he 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 pressed on and he made something out of it as we know today. However, in 1967, he was diagnosed with early on sl uh, slow progressing form of ALS. So up until this point, he was able to walk, he was able to talk, he was able to do the do the do, but he 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 got it essentially, and he was told that he'd only have a few years at most to live. Um, and over and over time, he'd become fully paralyzed, and rightly so, he fell into a deep depression um, because of this and very much had to deal with his mental health because of that. Um, his doctors advised him to continue um, his studies and his supervisor, um, Dennis, was actually a huge support for him and convinced him to continue working even though he had to develop um, ALS. So, he, when he first was diagnosed he could still walk he just had difficulty he he had he needed supports to walk and his speech was very hard to understand he lost kind of the ability to talk coherently um and he, he actually though even though he struggled with this he de started developing a reputation of brilliance and brashness within his department because he would publicly challenge the work of his colleagues and professors at that um, and he would sometimes, well, he, he'd be right a good chunk of the time. He would call them out on something and say, this doesn't make sense. And the audience would be like, yeah, you're right, this doesn't. So he developed kind of this bold personality that's willing to challenge what other people think. Because back in the day, phys physicists, well, even today they still are, but they had, they'd kind of get stuck in their ways and they had very strong opinions on something. Um, today's much better, but it's still, it's still a thing. So, blah, blah, blah. yeah, so he was, during, during Hawking's time, um, there was much debate over kind of the theory of the universe. Where did the universe come from? Was it a Big Bang? Was it something else? And he actually um, worked during his degree um, with, inspired by a famous physicist, which we probably mentioned once or twice, named Roger Penrose. Um, where he applied these kind of theorems of a space-time singularity in a black hole to um, kind of the expanding universe. So his his thesis, which he which he submitted in 1965 for his PhD, was called "The Properties of Expanding Universes," and he graduated in March of 1966 from Cambridge. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I could go on about this for a while and there's a whole bunch of theories and achievements Hawking had in his lifetime but but the big one I mentioned is Hawking radiation so Hawking predicted that he, he looked at black holes and he realized there must be some because of these huge gravitational effects in the vacuum of space there must be some kind of um the, the quantum fields that permeate the vacuum must be coupled to this intense gravity in some way and he performed an approximate calculation of quantum field theory and curved space-time and he derived the black holes the the perfect black body also emit radiation they also they emit thermal radiation just like your kind of oven top does when it gets hot and this was kind of one of the first calculations that had ever been done that combined kind of quantum field theory and curved space-time um kind of can, can, can combine quantum mechanics and gravity. We don't have a theory of quantum gravity today, but it was one of the beginnings. It, it led to a whole area of research. And even today, like I'm still researching his stuff and I know tons of people who do. So it opened up all kinds of avenues and it created more problems as well, like the information loss paradox, which is something Hawking worked on until he died and hasn't been completely solved yet. Um, but I'll, but I'll, but I won't talk about that today. So what's really motivational to me is that Hawking did all of this with, he did this with the help with a lot of his friends, he even had his own little personal entourage, because as he got older, his ALS got worse. And at first he was able to type with his hands and 
steer with his hands, but eventually he lost even that, and he had to use a single... I, I don't know the details of the setup, but he, he had to use kind of a cheek muscle to type or and steer himself around. Um, he, he had it hooked up to his computer on his chair, and I, I don't really know how that worked, but it goes to show that his, his disease definitely got worse, and he had his own little entourage of pe- um, nurses and health uh, staff that would follow him around and make sure that he could he was all right and help him stay clean and all that jazz. Um, but he was able to make all these amazing theories and predictions and do all this great physics, which a lot of it I haven't talked about, all while being completely paralyzed. Um, so he, he's written a lot of books about that. He's an author. Um, very motivational. He's one of my favorite physicists of all time. I have extreme respect for him. And aside from the fact that they told him, like he, they told him he had two years to live at most, and he beat that. He lived until he was 76. So a very, very famous celebrity physicist who actually made huge contributions to his field. Um, he did lots of public outreach. And yeah, I really like him because I literally study Hawking radiation. So a lot of respect for him. I mean, there's definitely some controversy to him, which I won't get into. He was a bit of a player, I've heard. Um, a bit of a flirt, ladies' man. But that's that's something else. I, I, will, not, I will not disrespect the dead. <laughs> well, I think... Rip. Yeah, Hawking is someone who's been touched all our lives in some way, whether we're learning about him. I believe one of our old professors was a great grandson in terms of supervisors about him, or maybe it was like a grandson. Uh, that, that was one of our math professors at uh, our old university. But I also want to mention that on one of our first original radio shows, long before we had the podcast, but we had a discussion about Stephen Hawking. This was right after he passed away, and so we talked about his life and his work, and so maybe that's something we can touch on again someday, is talking about his work and just delving into that itself, because he has a lot of interesting research and ideas that are were world changing at that point and are still having rippling effects today on how we see particularly black holes but also the universe yeah perhaps we should do some cornerstone scientist math um episodes on that but i think this is a good place to stop thank you liam for the enlightening story and with that i will see you guys next week thank you for listening Take care. Bye, everyone. See ya.